Hi, I'm Christine Hopkins, and I'm co-author of 100 Things to Do in Galveston Before You Die. And, well, today is September 8th, and this is the 120th anniversary of the 1900 storm, also known as the Great Storm. And so we wanted to take you back to um, what Galveston would have been like um, leading into that storm and what it was like that day. Um, so I'm here with Denise Alexander with the Galveston Historical Foundation. And so, Denise, can you tell us what it was like, if, what Galveston was like leading into September 8th, 1900. Sure, so we'll kind of give a little bit of background information on what, what, like you said, what Galveston was like. So Galveston was founded in 1838 and all through those 70 or so years, the population of Galveston continued to grow. We were larger than Houston, which I think now we're in Dallas, I think people are kind of shocked to hear. But so we were port city, cotton industry, the port was our main thing. We were not the playground of the Southwest at that time, as we like to say our seawall and beaches are now. It was really focused around commerce on the harbor and the bay. So, um, and we had about, at 1900, we had about 37,000 residents in Galveston. So we have this picture here and I can kind of show you about how dense Galveston was. So I think when people think of Galveston now, they know it goes all the way out to the West End. But at that time, we were really concentrated from what is now UTMB at 6th Street all the way to maybe around 45th Street. So we were 37,000 people were crammed into that dense area. So a little bit different than it is now. So um, it's kind of interesting to think about. It. And you can see how there were no empty lots, no, no places like that. And so we were mainly known for the Strand. Um, it was a bustling business district. Um, some like to call it the Wall Street of the Southwest. And we had a lot of business and um, banking industry was primary, primarily what we did down there. Um, a lot of catalog sales. So I think sometimes that people forget, especially now in the age of buying something on your phone, that they used to have door-to-door -door salesmen. So like where the Tremont House Hotel is, that was the Mistrot Brothers. So it was a huge place where people kept hats and you would go out and sell them to places all throughout Texas. So it's kind of a interesting fact how much everything here was um, kind of centralized. And so then after the 1900 storm hit, we have a couple of photos here showing some of the destruction of the neighborhoods. And that primarily that destruction happened from what we now know as the seawall into um, around Broadway by Bishop's Palace to give kind of folks at home a little bit of idea of where the main destruction was. What made Galveston so important to the country at the time? So cotton, I, you know, every bit of research that I have done is cotton and railroads. So um, you're able to get your goods in from England, bananas in from South America, all those types of things, put them on a railroad line, ship them out into all points, points west and up through Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, so it was really the cotton industry that kind of held that together. Um, and we still do a lot of that now. Nothing has changed with that as far as our port being important um, as far as commerce goes. Um, and so then the United States, back and forth between England, they didn't have the ability to grow um, things that you had, could get out of South America. They didn't have the ability to have, they couldn't do some of the things that we did. So there was a shipping back and forth. So there was a lot of that. And also during that time, Galveston was a huge point of immigration. So um, folks coming in and out of um, Galveston from Germany, primarily Germany, um, parts of some parts of England, Scotland, that kind of thing is also what made it um, a pretty vital, vital role. They didn't always stay in Galveston, but they got on that train, like I mentioned before, and then they went to part, parts west mostly. So one of the properties that the Galveston Historical Foundation operates, one of my favorites on the island, is Bishop's Palace. So can you tell us what was happening at the Grisham home, Bishop's Palace, um, on September 8th, 1900? Um, some of the family was at home during the 1900 storm. Um, Mrs. Gresham was, but Mr. Gresham was not. Um, the storm debris reached 14th Street, and there's a lot of photos out. You can see those online pretty easily showing this debris pile. And so um, since that house is raised, even at this point, the first floor is about 25 feet off the ground. A lot of folks took shelter there. Um, it is noted that um, from an article in the newspaper that Mr. Gresham wrote that they had over 155 people take shelter in the house and they were not discriminatory in any way toward, um, uh, it specifically mentions black people and white people, anybody that could wanted to seek shelter there, they fed them, housed them, and he said that they would not kick out any unfortunate soul out of the house. So if someone is visiting Galveston and they want to learn a little bit more about the 1900 storm, you know, what, where can they go for that? So yes, you can. You can learn about the Great Storm movie. It's a, um, about a 20 minute film. It's shown on the hour, five days a week at Pier 21. It covers the um, 
before the storm, the aftermath of the storm, a little bit about the grade raising um, and how the city government changed at that point and the impact on the residents of the city. These photos um, on this easel are from a private collection from the Waters family that GHF um, is fortunate enough to have copies of. And so what, there are a few things about these photos I think that are so striking. One, they're very, very clear, even printed off on our GHF printer. And two, it shows kind of the total destruction with these huge timbers, um, with this kind of metal frame here that also you'll see that's echoed in something else that you'll get to see here in a few minutes. And so you can see folks moving the debris around, how, how some folks' houses st stood and some didn't. And so um, I think that's pretty interesting. If this was your house and this was your neighbor, it wouldn't be there. And how, much, how would that would have felt? I think probably would have been fairly remarkable. Um, but I think it's this photo is from around 35th and R. So a lot of times we show pictures that are kind of centered around um, what we now consider the San Jacinto district. But that one is a little bit further out. And this one is at 23rd and P. So if you're driving down 23rd Street um, to and from downtown, um, you could imagine what that would have looked like by seeing this picture. So if you're interested in, in learning more about Galveston and our historic downtown, um, I happened to write this book a few years ago published by Arcadia Publishing, which details all of the architecture in downtown Galveston. So if you're more interested in that, check it out. So next up, we have Dr. Hal Needham, and he is an expert um, on hurricanes. He's a meteorologist, and so we're really happy to have him talk to you a little bit about what Isaac Klein and his brother Joseph were thinking. They were the meteorologists in Galveston at the time of the storm and what they thought about the possibility of a storm of this magnitude hitting Galveston and then also what it was like to be here on the island on September 8th and, and afterwards. So how? Yeah, thank you so much. You know, Isaac and Joseph Klein were both great scientists and they were obviously affected by hurricanes on the periphery, but had never been in the core of a hurricane before. And that's what we find a lot of times. People say, oh, I've been in a hurricane before if they've been on the, the fringes of it. But when you're in the heart of a hurricane, it's a whole different matter. The best science at the time suggested that Galveston could not be destroyed by a hurricane because of the wetlands around it and also the shallow water depth off, off the coast. People said in general, it's not not going to really support a massive storm surge, which is the wall of salt water that comes in, and it's the most destructive hazard with a hurricane. But nonetheless, on September 8, 1900, they really learned what it's like to be in the core of a major hurricane. So sustained winds were around 120, 125 miles an hour, and it pushed this 16-foot wall of salt water across the city. So I think they would have been really surprised, actually, and, and, and a little confused, because in the morning before the storm, on Saturday morning, these huge breakers were breaking on the coast, you know, every, every minute or so, but the weather wasn't really deteriorating yet. It, was, it wasn't raining yet, and the winds weren't that high, and then all of a sudden you had an offshore wind, but the water kept rising. So these elements together would suggest something un unusual is happening, but I think even with uh, the great scientists they were, they probably couldn't quite picture the force that this thing was going to hit the island with, and I think they would have been surprised just to see the, the magnitude of this event. How? what can you tell us? What time did the storm hit? And if you were in a home or say you were walking on the street, what I know you were talking about the winds, but visually, what would people have been seeing and hearing and experiencing? Uh, hurricanes throw three hazards at us, heavy rain, strong wind, and the saltwater storm surge. So a lot of pi people picture hurricanes as just being wind events, because that's what we often see on TV, but it's really the saltwater storm surge that kills the majority of the people and causes the, mo the most destruction. So what they would have seen in Galveston, people would have woken up on Saturday morning, they would have noticed water starting to rise in the streets, and they would have heard rumors there are these massive waves hitting on the coast. So a lot of people went to the coast to see these big waves coming in. It was exciting at first, it, it was a little bit breezy. It was a little bit cooler. It had been a really hot month up to that point. And so it would have been almost exciting and entertaining at first. Water started running through the streets in the morning. Kids were playing with uh, making up little uh, boats to sail down the street. It, it was fun at first. And then all of a sudden, the salt water started pushing in and taking out some of the bathhouses. And then later in the morning, a few, a few of the actual houses near the coast started getting flooded and destroyed. So I think by midday, the winds would have been really picking up. The salt water would have been really racing through the 
the streets and then people realized okay this is not your average storm we have to get home or we have to get to shelter the winds would have really started setting in I think getting to near hurricane force by late afternoon and that's where we had a lot of devastation from both the wind and the water so unfortunately uh, Galveston had a lot of slate roofs this was after the fires and in the 1800s they decided okay we're not going to build wooden roofs we, we started seeing more roofs made out of slate and unfortunately once the winds hit category two category three a lot of that slate went airborne and was killing people and it just became really a, a terribly destructive wind event but then the salt water racing through the streets was just starting to destroy a lot of houses by I would say late afternoon and getting into the evening and the worst of the storm was I would say evening and into after dark um, just really destroying a lot of the island. We've now gone through the storm the storm has happened you know lives have been lost what the next day, you know, as they say, when the sun's rising after that terrible night, what, what did Galveston look like? Yeah, so the day we get hit by a hurricane, it's, it's dangerous, it's severe, but often the most difficult part is the recovery, the long, long recovery afterwards. Uh, Galvestonians would have woken up um, almost in a, in a daze. I mean, the thousands of people died the night before, uh, just the recovery process, starting with uh, trying to r recover bodies and, and many injured people. So just really trying to find the people that are alive, trying to, to take care of the wounded, but also recovering the dead. And that became a really gruesome uh, process. Keep in mind, much of the city was completely um, completely in rubble from this raging seawater. So bodies were buried in that. Galveston also had a lot of animals at the time, a lot of uh, cows and horses, a lot of horses in the city, horse-drawn carriages were everywhere. So you have these dead animal bodies in the mix. It quickly became very putrid smelling, very gruesome. And all of a sudden, okay, you have to deal with this. And so this was a process that I took, I think took many days to just really get going with the, the bodies. The bodies were recovered. Uh, there was an attempt to bury them at sea but many of them washed back in on the beach and so it just a very gruesome thing where they really had to start burning piles of bodies and just just an awful awful sense and also many homeless uh, tents popped up on the beach people not only did we have many dead but we also had many homeless and then eventually it would in the in the coming weeks as debris was cleared we, we actually see pictures of debris piles but new houses going up I mean, people were really desperate just to find housing and shelter and in those blocks closest to the beach where we had some really big beach style mansions they're replaced in some sense by shotgun houses that quickly went up almost like FEMA trailers today after a big event we'll see thousands of FEMA trailers come in because people really need a place to live quickly that's what happened in Galveston as well so in some of those blocks closest to the beach we now see really smaller style homes that we think were built soon after the storm after the 1900 storm like you said there were there was houses being built quickly but what was the most important thing that Galveston residents did after the storm to protect us, um, protect the island from future storms like this? Yeah, it's amazing how quickly the seawall went up, built between 1902 and 1904, completed within four years of the great 1900 storm. And even a more amazing feat of civil engineering was the grade raising project, this idea to raise an inhabited city, over 500 city blocks, 2,000 buildings, raised from 1904 to around 1910, 1911. But this was a really difficult process. I mean, building the seawall, that was on the fringe of the city. It didn't directly affect that many people, but the grade raising put muddy water in the streets for for months and years, and so people had to deal with this. A canal was dug through the city. Can you imagine rebuilding your home after the 1900 storm and then finding out your home is in the right of way for the canal? So you're gonna have to move that home for five years and then move back after the canal's filled in. Not only was a canal dug through the city, but four ocean-going ships were built in Europe, in the Netherlands, and in Germany, sailed across the ocean and, and dredged out sediment from Galveston Bay, piping it into the city for more than five years. Uh, the large churches, huge buildings were raised by putting hundreds of men under them with jack screws. There were plenty of excuses why they could have said it's too hard to raise a city. We can't build a canal. We can't build ships in Europe and sail them over to raise our city. We can't raise massive churches with hundreds of men under them. But they, they did it all. They had many excuses, but they found a way to save the city, to build the seawall, and to raise the island. It's still an inspirational story, and I, I still think it's one of the most amazing civil engineering projects in the history of the world.
This is one of the most fantastic grade raising pictures because it shows that the city was raised in sections. You can see the section on the right is already raised. The section on the left is being prepared for raising. These houses are elevated and you know afterwards we can see that that the grade matches but we can see the sharp divide here and get the idea that the city was raised in sections. It took a lot of planning. It, this didn't just happen. It took years and years of planning. Everyone had to work together. You knew the high water. You, you, there was a line on utility poles in your community that told you how high your neighborhood was going to be raised and so you could prepare for that you could raise your your barns or your horse sheds or your houses it took a lot of effort but everyone really needed to come together for the grade raising it affected everybody but it ended up paying off just in 1909 and 1915 hurricane soon followed the grade raising and it showed that the this project really saved the city so if people want to learn more about the i guess the meteorology and about the storm how can they do that yeah, the, the history here is so inspirational we're in a time where a lot of bad things have been happening in, in the last few decades and we need to learn more about resiliency and we have resiliency tourism here in Galveston to inspire not only people in Texas but to inspire the world. I mean we really dug in and I often call Galveston the world's most resilient coastal city. I launched a hurricane tour three years ago and I've been giving that tour privately but last week we actually launched the tour with Galveston Experience Company. There's a, a tour bus every day at noon that leaves from 15th and Seawall at Galveston Experience Company. It's a one hour tour it covers the history of the hurricanes, the innovations and creative solutions we came up with here, and also a lot of stories with the people that lived on the island, the seawall, the grade raising. It's a lot of inspiration packed into one hour, leaving every day at noon from 15th and Seawall. So in last step, we're going to transition into the next part of this story um, related to the 120th anniversary of the 1900 storm. So this is my friend, um, sculptor, iron preservationist, blacksmith, Doug McLean. So Doug, Tell us about um, what we're looking at here, and tell us about an Italian immigrant named Pompeo Capini. Pompeo Capini was a sculptor who migrated to Texas, I believe, in the 1890s. And he did most of his work in the San Antonio and Austin area. He had worked on many commissions, but this particular sculpture called The Victims of the Galveston Flood he did in 1904 at the request of the city of Galveston. After the 1900 storm, they approached him to do a sculpture that would show the disaster and um, the resilience of the people that had gone through the storm. And when he presented it to them in the plaster study, the city would just felt at the time that the sculpture was too harsh and so powerful and so meaningful but also so depressing that they decided to turn it down. So the plaster study went back to Austin. It was then taken to the, um, the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. It was shown um, there and it, instead of being in the sculpture pavilion like it intended to be, it was the crate would, was mislabeled and it ended up in the Texas pavilion and as you can see it really didn't fit very well. It only had about an inch to the ceiling. And, um, so this is, this is the sculpture in the Texas pavilion. These, sculpt these photographs, I believe this was a studio photograph that had been edited and this one I believe was done, taken in his studio in Austin. Uh, the, I had just found out recently that he had shown the original plaster he opened up his studio to show it to neighbors and friends and when they came into his studio there were approximately a thousand people who came through during the showing and they were so uh, emotional about having seen the work and many of them were crying and that he actually sat down on his front steps after he showed it and broke into tears himself. It's a, it's a very powerful piece of work and I can understand um, how it overcame a lot of people at the time. So after um, Pompeo Capini presented it in his hometown, to, in his gallery, what happened to the sculpture? Well, he had actually offered the sculpture back to the University of Texas. And they put it in storage and for many years. And it came back out in 1914 for an exhibition at the University of Texas campus. And then it went back into storage with several other of his pieces. Being in plaster, it was very delicate. And unfortunately, it was put into a warehouse and never found again. 
many searches over many decades were never unable were never able to uh, find the work, and so it's been declared forever lost. It's also thought that after several fires in warehouses and several that flooded out that it could have been destroyed in one of those. The plaster would never have held up in those situations. So let's see what you've been working on. I first saw the photographs of the lost work about four years ago. And I was extremely overwhelmed by the face of the woman and the passion that her face showed. And initially, I really had only intended to do her portrait on the scale that it's at. And I worked on it for nearly 100 hours to get it right, and to get the expression the way that I wanted it. After I got that, it was just from the tops of the shoulders up. And after I, I did that, I just felt compelled to do the rest of the sculpture. It was too powerful to me to not complete it. So with just the two photographs to work from, and knowing that I had a lot of resolution to all the other areas of the sculpture, um, I set out about two and a half years ago to complete the sculpture. I, it became very evident to me along the way that I had initially thought that the woman was looking at her, her baby in her arms, but in fact, she's really looking at her next step. And that made a change to me. It made me, it brought the whole idea of persevering and survival to me. And the woman was really trying to save her children and taking that next step forward and it, with all the diversity in the world. And I think that's such a universal issue for all the storms that have come since then, all the tragedies that are going on even today, we're all forced to take that next step forward as hard as it may be. So this is, um, you can understand why the city fathers may have felt it difficult uh, to bring to the island 100 years ago, 120 years ago. And the, the hand reaching up from the debris, it's a kind of a distressing image, but it's very much a part of the 1900 storm and very much a part of all the disasters that are going on today. Uh, I tried to be as realistic with the work. I had my own hand in this as much as it's really my interpretation of this lost work. I tried to f get the feel of the, the wet wetness on her gown, um, the young girl clasping to her mother, really hanging on for dear life, the mother holding her child, and really holding together the, f the foot up, the mother, her feet wrapping around and clenching the rocks and pulling her forward, and the, the sense that the daughter is literally hanging on for life. Those were really important in getting her weight shifted properly so that you could feel her movement forward. That was a, a, a challenge, but one that was really, uh, I love the challenge. And I think I've got it, I think I got it pretty close to right. Now I'm trying to finish the toenails and fingernails and the little details um, so that It'll be, uh, it'll be just the way I want it. So here we are 120 years after um, the deadliest natural disaster in United States history. You know, as you mentioned, Galveston's determination, the determination of our women, our residents, and the resilience of this community. You know, um, so when Pompeo Capini did this, his plaster study, it was called Victims of Galveston. And now it's called Hope. So why did you decide to to call it hope? I decided to make the change because I didn't want it to be necessarily about victims. I wanted it to be about that hope we all have in moving forward and showing our resiliency in natural disasters. And as the doctor just spoke, this resiliency that Galveston has shown over many decades and continues to show, I, I, it really hope was a better title for it, I believe. Um, that, that's really why I thought hope was, was better, it was to the point, and it really fit the sculpture. Well, and, and so the last part of this is, you know, we are, like I said, it's 120 years after the storm, and so we are now raising funds to, to do the casting, or the molding and the casting. The sculpture's gonna be cast in bronze, mm -hmm. and where's that gonna take place? 
Uh, it's going to take place in Smithville, Texas, at a foundry called Omega Bronze in Smithville. And it should take three to four months for the completion. We're trying very hard to get it completed within the year 120th anniversary. So, and the park is due to open in late, early December, I believe. So we're hoping to be able to have it in place during the opening of the park. Well, and so one of the things that is that is great for us as a, a BOI and a Galvestonian is that we can all, I can be part, we can all be part of bringing hope to Galveston. So if you go to galvestonsculpture.com, you can make a donation to help being part of that. We're also, there's a, a brick campaign, so you can actually purchase a brick that will go in the park, um, you know, to show you're, you're part of Galveston, you're part of this history. And um, the park is gonna be the new city park that's located between City Hall and the new fire station right off of uh, Rose which is 25th Street and you know I think so many people have such a um, connection to Galveston this is a way to really kind of show that um, and this is a, uh, you know when Hal was here earlier he was talking about again like this resilience and this is such a symbol of that and so I mean I think it's so amazing as a Galvestonian and a storm survivor you know we all went through Hurricane Ike like being able to bring that to Galveston so so I mean what is what is your favorite part of the sculpture I would have to say my favorite part of the sculpture is, is that I love the baby. The mother's face is what, to me, everything comes together with the mother's face. She really tells the story. I love the little girl and the way she's clasping her, her arms around her, her mother's waist, too. There's just something so beautiful that tells that, that love, but also that, that fear and that uh, absolute need to have her mother's, um, that security that she feels in her mother holding you know holding on to her mother well and i guess last thing i want to say is for people that are interested in learning more information about the 1900 storm you know we mentioned um the great storm documentary at pier 21 theater um how um, hurricane hal or dr hurricane hal has his tours that are available there's so many ways to hear more about the history and then this is going to be a new permanent feature in galveston um, that i think is a real tribute to our residents and our community and the people that didn't just weren't just victims of the storm but survivors mm -hmm. so well thanks that's kind of a, we, we hope this is helpful information on this 120th anniversary of the 1900 storm um, you'll probably see lots of things on the weather channel today about the 1900 storm that tends to run every year and again you know this community is resilient um, it's greater and grander than ever and um, we hope you come down and see us soon.